don't have a script, we're just going to go play it by ear. Uh, and I asked Harry if we could do like a Johnny Carson type show. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, maybe we'll begin. A couple of years ago, um, maybe about three years ago, I was in downtown LA hanging around and walking and um, took a quick stop at a place called Felipe's in downtown LA and uh, there was Oscar and uh, we started chatting away and uh, uh, turns out, I guess, uh, we'd seen each other for, what, maybe 30, 40 years on the streets uh, and never really had a chance to sit down and talk and uh, this was the first conversation, basically, and uh, um, started talking and I uh, uh, had wondered what was going on with all of his work uh, because I'd, I'd always seen him take photographs and I'd heard about a lot of his work, but um, it seemed like it would be uh, very important for uh, uh, many more people to see the work under different kind of circumstances in a gallery or museum and um, and so I, I passed on the name of uh, Cho Noriega to uh, Oscar and of course it's like uh, it's a well Cho and I we worked for many years so it's always a relay race and I handed him and it became something uh, uh, very big I think uh, because of of course we had to have Oscar uh, be very interested in, in engaging in this and uh, and I'm not sure and, and I guess it turned out pretty good for you. Right? Yes, that was a, a, a very, a very good a chance meeting, and I think that kind of uh, is an example of, of, of my life, and uh, and and my my photographs. I I, I tend to uh, uh, kind of uh, document situations that I find myself in, whether they're uh, uh, casual uh, uh, events or you know historic events, and. Uh, uh, the uh, I, I I I do I do want to thank Harry for for initiating the contact with uh, with the Chicano Studies Library, and um, it was a very very good chance meeting at Philippe's. We had I think we had uh, 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 their Philippe sandwich and we talked and but <laughs> but uh, my um, just for inform you know. Uh, what happened is we wound up do, uh, archiving over 3,000 of my images here at the library. And hopefully they'll be uh, available for scholars or students or uh, public in general to actually uh, access them and use them for publications, for exhibits, and for uh, um, you know, researching history, researching culture, the culture of the uh, you know, in Southern California and uh, other areas that I've documented. But um, since we're kind of going, you know, playing it by ear, uh, you know, if, if later on we will open it up to, to questions and if you want to talk about specific images, um, you know, what inspired that particular event or, or, or um, how I happened to document um, a s certain people or or what inspired me to do that? You know, I'll be glad to to answer any questions that that'll help you understand the exhibit a little bit better. And uh, um, I'll I'll just let Harry, you know, ask me um, some questions if you want to start back. You know, at, at any point in in my in time in my my life or you know, Oscar, I, I think I first saw your work in the Consolfus magazine years ago, mm -hmm. uh, maybe at the start of the seventies. But uh, I think maybe the thing that always kind of struck uh, me was that uh, uh, I guess most of our encounters were in East LA all through a very tumultuous period of uh, the early 70s. One never really knew what was going to be taking place on the streets. Uh, it's still kind of like that. Uh, LA is very kind of one of these spontaneous places where things uh, shift and change uh, all the time. And, uh, and being a street photographer means that uh, one is really engaged in the environment but also subject to the conditions of the environment. And so um, quite often when things are taking place, uh, many people are leaving and then the photographers wind up going up in front uh, to capture the image. And, uh, and of course it's always about aesthetics also. So things that Oscar would find very um, interesting uh, and point his camera and there's always different people shooting different directions. Uh, I kind of often wondered what he was taking pictures of uh, and had not had a chance to see many of them. And so uh, it's basically, you know, what did I miss? And, uh, and that's, where the, that's where the curiosity came to see his work. And, uh, and so maybe, Oscar, the question I would uh, ask you is, uh, what is it that has actually attracted your eye to point your camera in certain directions uh, 
what are some of the concerns and things that entice you to, to document it as being sort of a, a significant moment uh, in your life um, that can be preserved and then uh, essentially shared with others? Okay, well, what I'd like to do perhaps is just preface that with just a really brief uh, history on, on my, my uh, what influenced me as a photographer. And I can thank my parents uh, because they, they kept an, a family album of, of, of pictures that they took. And that was uh, during the 50s. I, I remember always, as, as a youth, I would, I would always look at, I would look at this album that my mother had, had kept. And there were all these very nice black and white photographs. And they were placed in this black album with little corners that keep the photographs in, in place. And I have very fond memories of people that I either met or I knew or, or only knew through, through the stories that perhaps my mother or my grandmother would tell me about uh, people in, in, in these uh, photographs. So uh, that was kind of my initial um, introduction to photography and, uh, and uh, keeping uh, family histories and cultural histories. And later on, as I, as I grew up in high school, I, I kind of uh, uh, started taking pictures with a little Instamatic camera, this little kind mm -hmm. of point and shoot. You take pictures and you send it to the lab and you get back these prints. And uh, I, I actually have a photograph of, even though I, I do a lot of social political stuff, I mean, I do a lot with the arts too. So I have a picture of my first car that I took. And coincidentally, is my, my first car was a 1950 Ford convertible. And it happens to be yellow. So uh, the kind of one of the iconic images that you see on my exhibit is the 1947 Chevy, which is also yellow. But I have, a, I have that picture of that car that I took when I was, my first car when I was 16 years old. And I parked it in front of my car, I mean in front of my house, and I took a picture of it because I was very proud of it. And, uh, and I, I still have that photograph, which one of my, I have, you know, I've taken literally thousands of pictures. But anyway, that's just a kind of a um, um, coincidence. But... Then later on, when I was in the service, I bought my first 35 millimeter camera and kind of self-taught myself. And then when I got out of service, I went to college and got active in, uh, in, um, in political activities through the, uh, what then was called UMAS. UMAS was a student activist uh, group at Valley College. And um, it was just my way of, of kind of com hooking up to my community and that became in fact, my extended family, and, uh, and it became very much part of my life. So um, I would get involved with, with uh, political activities. And I, I hope I'm not rambling, but your kind of question was what, 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 what inspires me to take certain images. But uh, as students, we were, we were very politically active in the, in the times. This was 1960. Um, I got a service in '68, and I went to college in '69. So by that time, the uh, the uh, the walkouts happened, which you were part of as a student, right? And um, it just became something that I I found necessary to get out, and I, I would go to these events because I want to be part of them. But because uh, I was a photographer, I I always took my camera, so I always wound up taking photographs of these events, and I always trying to make it as powerful of an image as possible. I was tr trying to tell a story without really knowing what the end product would be. I just felt something that I, that I needed to do to document and uh, for my own personal reasons. And, uh, and that kind of led to, to people knowing my work. And, uh, and I thank uh, Rudy Acuna, who's a doctor at Acuna at Cal State Northridge, for kind of recognizing um, whatever talent I had, and he, he gave me my first job as a, as a photographer photographing uh, some of his books. Oh, but, but um, um, which were seventh grade uh, social studies books. But anyway, uh, that's how I got to meet a lot of people. Uh, like through Rudy Acuna, I met Cesar Chavez, and then through him I also met um, Jose Angel Gutierrez, who was from Texas. and. Uh, and they were all key players. I mean, I, I, I was very fortunate to be involved with all the, all the key players. And I got to meet people 
you know, the, there was instructors at Cal State Northridge, and they were also very active in, in the political movement of the time, like Bert Corona, who was, um, he started a, a group called uh, Casa de Hermandad, I think, and they were dealing with, uh, with uh, immigration problems, uh, which still exist to this day. And, um, but uh, I also got to meet Reyes Lopez Tijerina, uh, and um, uh, Donisa Morales, uh, you know, uh, Rosalio Munoz, who's here in the audience with us. And uh, I didn't meet, actually I met him, but I didn't really get to meet him until much later. I got to photograph him, which is interesting. Uh, he's in one of my photographs, but I, I was there in the Chicano Moratorium, but, but I, I didn't really know who he was, but later on I got to meet him and, you know, and know that he was uh, the, uh, was the founder or the director of the, of the moratorium, um, which was the anti-Vietnam moratorium. But anyway, uh, um, I, just to kind of capsulize that, I, I, I look at it, I studied also as a, a art at, at Northridge, so I, I put that together, art and social political interests, and, and somehow they all come together to make you know, artistic photographs, yet document social, political, cultural activities. So, um, it, and then I, of course, I also love taking pictures of my feet, and things are non social political. I can do, you know, I like to just do abstract things, and, but um, uh, in a nutshell, that's, I mean, I, I was also influenced by, by, by art, you know, by artists. I, I got to meet a lot of artists, like, uh, um, as one of my assignments, I was, I was, uh, uh, there was an instructor named Carlos Atze uh, in the Chicano Studies Department who said, well, your assignment for the semester is about and document all these Chicano artists that are out there. At the time, there weren't that many, because this was like uh, uh, 70. But I got to meet the Goez, the Gonzalez brothers, who were at Goez Art Gallery. I got to meet the Streetscapers. I got to meet the Mexicano Art Center artists. Um, the uh, Los Four, and um, so I mean everything kind of snowballs. One thing leads to another. You meet people. You meet you know get into situations. And I got to meet you with uh, Asco and Willie Head On and all you know your 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 group of artists. So all of that is included in, in the exhibit. But um, that's. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, Oscar derailed him right now for a second. But, um, um, I, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting, Oscar, was sort of this time period that we grew up in and uh, were working. Is um, I think maybe for some of the younger people who are kind of um, kind of didn't live through the actual moment, um, was uh, this was a civil rights uh, movement era uh, where um, uh, different groups had to basically assert. Uh, uh, their uh, understanding that we actually were part of America. And uh, sometimes it would be necessary to create a new term uh, that caused some level of separation of identity, but really was to insist that we belonged here and that we were not about to go anywhere. And through this sort of developed various theories and ideas that would be uh, incorporated into America, uh, which is sort of this uh, uh, complex idea of uh, the country. and. Um, and as it turns out, I think that the term Chicano was a very important uh, a term that uh, suddenly has become reinserted into the dialogue. I think a bit with uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, identifying people as being Chicano artists and uh, making it an international term once again, and specifically in a time when uh, uh, we have uh, sort of these uh, racist laws in uh, Arizona and other places and we have sort of high unemployment and we have multiple wars and, and to some extent it's almost like revisiting the 60s and 70s uh, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, your work seems to be um, uh, capture uh, on some level um, the innocence of, uh, of an understanding of, of, who, of who many people were but at the same time a very uh, assertive nature that, uh, that everyone would maintain some level of normal, normalcy uh, and be able to achieve uh, achieve whatever it is that they sought in America uh, by working hard and uh, and to also in, in many of your photographs of young people uh, great pride in the way they present themselves uh, and playing playing out the roles as being young people of that of their era 
And, uh, and I think that seems to be something that you were attracted to in terms of visualizing. Um, you capture people that look uh, strong. And of course, uh, we came uh, after an era where, I mean, you, you know, yourself were in the Marines, but it was like uh, we were sort of the product, the people that fought in World War II and uh, proved that we um, actually had a place. And uh, so, um, you know, I think your role, your role as a photographer, uh, you know, you might say uh, you were documenting, but uh, it was sort of very, really a very important, comprehensive effort to gather uh, visual documentation and imagery and basically proof that uh, so much had taken place. And uh, without someone like you, it, it would all be gone. Well, uh, thank you for that. And uh, as I said, I, I really had no idea that, that, I would, that my work would play such a key role in, in, in capturing this history. But honestly, uh, I, um, I do feel that, that a lot of the images that I take are, are an, of, of people in the kind of an extended family because Um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, I have a very interesting family because there's so many people, so many different uh, uh, um, categories of, of work or, or um, uh, uh, personalities, and I see that in, in everyday uh, uh, people that I meet, and I go, well, that reminds me of, of this in, in my family. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, that I have been able to capture key roles, and I and, and I and I thank I am um, thankful that I have that ability to compre comprehend a, a situation or interpret a, an event, and then um, visually um, interpret that and present it to share with other people. So um, even though I the pictures are things that I treasure uh, for myself, but I also, um, I'm, I'm happy to share them with everybody and, and then hopefully people will see uh, something uh, positive in them and help them understand situations that they might find themselves in or understand history or understand, you know, cultural things and uh, um, so. Well, and uh and you know, Oscar, I think another thing of that particular era, um, you know, we were limited in terms of receiving information primarily from television. Uh, that was sort of the primary delivery device for um, uh, imagery and sort of an understanding of what was taking place during that era. And, uh, and of course, uh, print, uh, magazines and print, and, and basically both formats were extremely expensive and very difficult to penetrate. Uh, uh, because, of course, the people that uh, were um, in control of these um, uh, uh, media uh, had a particular um, agenda, and one of the agendas uh, that has been proven over time, and of course, which is one of Chuan's specialties, is that of exclusion, of not, in, not including Chicano imagery and the Chicano life and the importance of the population into the national dialogue. And, um, and so, uh, again, once again, uh, the importance of an individual going out and dedicating their life to uh, basically photographing and capturing the images, um, which of course, uh, you know, we had to wait long enough to have enough uh, young people grow up and to become researchers and academics and people that would write essays based on the work. And of course, uh, each and every single one of your photographs, I think, is uh, enough uh, fuel to generate a dissertation each. Uh, I'm almost afraid to say anything now because I'm afraid it's going to be somebody's footnote. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, it, um, it, it, it just seems, Oscar, that um, the works that have been selected for the show, of course, out of the many thousands of works, uh, uh, really kind of, in a way, crystallize uh, your overall intent, which is to, again, bring forth a very, um, uh, you know, and I wrote, one of the, I wrote one of the essays about Oscar's work is, uh, is sort of this sort of optimism, but yet dealing with reality uh, in the sense of what it would take to get the work out and how important, uh, how important it was to, uh, uh, you know, they say photographers see, but it's really about uh, vision. Uh, you know, we have a couple of photographers in the audience here. Um, it really is, uh, you almost know what you're looking for 
and you'll snap the, you'll, you'll take the picture when whatever it is that you've already been thinking about presents itself in front of your lens. And uh, not many photographers um, have uh, 100,000 events take place that are worthy of being photographed. But, uh, you know, someone like Oscar means that he probably has many visions. Well, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, and, and I totally agree with you, is that we, there was an absence of positive images in the mass media about us. And I think that was kind of what, uh, that I was uh, attempting to do was, um, in my own way, was present uh, my side of the story, which wasn't being shown, was it? Um, the experiences that I had, and and um, uh, I grew up reading like Time magazine, which then it would come every week, and you look at it, and you look at the pictures, look at the stories of the whole world, you know, going all over the world, and and uh, there was a lot of there wasn't really positive images. Of, I grew up in Texas, and so I ran. I I I I, I can. I can say that I experienced a lot of negative stuff about, you know, about uh, being Hispanic or speaking Spanish, and it, and they still exist there. I mean, there's a lot of, and, and now you see that you're seeing it more and more. Uh, well, unfortunately, but you know, see the things in, in Arizona happening, trying to uh, trying to to eliminate uh, uh, positive educational uh, programs like. Uh, uh, Chicano studies and things like that, but and, and then you see the um, you see the, um, the, uh, the the demonization sort of, of of the immigrant, and I and and I in in my f photographs I try to show, um, and uh, of course I enjoy doing other things too, but I think the the the. Um, the things that we're seeing in this exhibit and, and, and these archives are, are specifically uh, in that in that realm of of um, of um, what is it called a genre or what do you call it? What would you call it? Yeah. Well, you, you know, Oscar, I've, I've got to mention one thing. Uh, today I went online and I clicked around and um, and there's one of Oscar's uh, images in a fashion magazine in Germany, uh, and you know this idea that. Uh, uh, the potential for the work to have been included internationally uh, is kind of striking a chord at this present time, which is kind of a, uh, kind of reflective also of a vacuum, uh, and also being ready to respond to such a vacuum of having, uh, you know, basically been working for this moment uh, uh, to have this uh, not only an exhibition but also to be um, uh, highlighted. I mean, you know, last week in the LA Times, and of course uh, there's probably going to be a lot more, but to sort of this. This opportunity um, it definitely will not go one that will be uh, uh, squandered. It will be something that uh, 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 not only winds up inspiring uh, the people that you documented, but again will remind people that there has been sort of a, a flaw in the viewpoint of what is American, uh, what is contemporary uh, North America all about. Uh, uh, you know, it's a vast, I mean, if we go out and watch TV right now, uh, you could change all the channels on English language TV and you'd be hard pressed to realize that there's so many Mexicans here in the first place. And of course, if you read the same with all of the contemporary media, it's still, you know, every once in a while, but there still needs to be much more to be done. And, um, and again, Oscar, I think uh, you have enough work to illustrate everything that would uh, take place over the next 10 years just to try to recoup the story. But uh, as things go on, of course, young people are inspired. Uh, they'll see that you've done all this work, and uh, uh, and uh, you know here there's a couple of my students from CalArts. I congratulate them for their MFAs recently or their BFAs. But uh, uh, these people that are very hungry for uh, an understanding of the dynamics between the creation of visual culture and the importance of how it uh, plays a role in interacting with social and political movements, and uh, and why it is that uh, someone again like your work. Uh, plays a significant role in in, in updating uh, Chicano history, and uh, and defies the people that would erase it from history. Again, like the people in Arizona and other people that are completely uh, fascistic in terms of their political beliefs, uh, and would would do anything they could to get rid of all your imagery, uh, which they won't succeed. <laughs> well, an in an interesting thought that, that came to mind right now when we were talking is recently, uh, during this summer, I, I still go out and I do a lot of 
uh, I just go out in the streets and I just look for images that, that inspire me to take a photograph of. And um, I went down by Lincoln Park uh, recently, down, which is in East Los Angeles. And I, I like to revisit places that I photographed before and to show maybe 10 years later, 20 years later. And, and, what it, and I went to a particular corner right there where there's a, there's a statue of, of Moctezuma, the, the, uh, the uh, was it Aztec or Mayan emperor? And there's a wall right behind it, which I photographed at one time, which was, there used to be a mural there, which was a, a, a large mural of, 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 by Leo Limon, one of the local mm -hmm. artists, which he did many years ago. But I have a picture of that. And I wanted to photograph that particular corner again. Right now, there's just a blank wall there where the mural's been obliterated, but there's graffiti on it. So I was taking pictures of the wall with the graffiti and people, I like to take pictures kind of people walking by, interacting with an environment, but there was a little grandma walking her, her kids back to, from the grocery store or something. One little kid was in a stroller, and there's two other little kids walking next to her, you know, jumping and skipping as they do. And one of the little girls, um, she, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. But, um, well, anyway, I, I get emotional, but don't don't worry about it. You erase that part of the tape. But, but, but one of the little kids, the one of the little kids saw me taking pictures, and she says, "Are you going to put us in the newspaper?" Well, you, you, you know, Oscar, I think that's uh, maybe one of the things I was hinting at is sort of this recognition of uh, the beauty of people just enjoying their lives and living, and again, uh, uh, what. You know, you mentioned the term of uh, demonizing, uh, sort of this whole, uh, you know, here's a whole population of people that have done a great uh, many things uh, throughout history and even in contemporary times, and yet uh, that they would be targeted as such, uh, to be almost targeted as the enemy of a country, and yet being very essential to the country. Uh, and of course, it requires people with a certain level of uh, self-awareness and education and, uh, and concern uh, to fight back in a way. Uh, and you know, and basically, Oscar, you've been basically a cultural warrior throughout, um, and, um, and, and I think maybe that's why you feel this kind of connection is, uh, you feel very protective of your people. And so it's, um, it's a role uh, that you play, and uh, you know, I think many people have probably uh, survived uh, maybe a bad day based on your defense, and uh, it's really wonderful. And, uh, you know, many of us in the, in the arts and uh, people that do academic work, uh, although it may um, uh, not be that clear uh, on the surface, uh, much of it, the motivation is really not only for corrective, but also for uh, uh, moments of insistence that we do belong here, that we are human beings, and that we're definitely capable of uh, determining our own um, uh, culture. And, um, and that should people um, uh, misinterpret that idea, we'll make certain that they get it right. Well, thank you. Well, I, you know, I, I, I would like to, um, if, you, if, if you're comfortable with it, maybe we could take some questions from the audience or if they have comments or want to talk about a particular image. I would be glad to do that. Does any, any, anybody in, in the, out there uh, have a particular question or a good comment? No, no bad comments. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know Rosalio had a, had a point of, of information he wanted to make about one of the images. He had a, is you still out there, Rosalio? Yeah, yeah. Did you have, a, did you have yeah. a point? Well, if we go to that image, it's a, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm in an image, but he's carrying a, a painting of a dead Chicano soldier. Uh, and I wanted to just, I don't know, comment a little bit on that. I may need some help on you. Anyway, uh, this on some of what you've been discussing, I think it was uh, La Raza newspaper and then magazine and Consapos, the Chicano student movement, started putting our images out. We didn't see ourselves. And we could see our families as not just families, uh, but communities, there. and That's that our right. communities were uh, 
political, historical, and cultural uh, oriented, and uh, we could begin talking about it. I, 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 I like that Oscar said he didn't know me or who I was at that demonstration. This is December 20th, uh, 1969, and it's the first Chicano moratorium. And I really like this photo because of the painting, which is, uh, it's a painting by Ramses Noriega, who actually, I may have been the initiator of some of the anti-war moratorium things, but Ramses was the organizer, but he also was a, the artist. And uh, I think that we didn't, you know, we talked about being at war and uh, Chicanos with medals and, and all of this thing, but then what we began emphasizing there was the death of our, our guys, our soldiers in the war and presenting it to the community. And, and I think Ramses did a tremendous job in putting that forward and that theme stayed with us all, all, all throughout. And I, Oscar, you caught that. I don't think you were taking, you were like you were saying, you weren't necessarily taking me there as a, a, a leader in the movement, but of that image of presenting uh, the issue of the deaths of our soldiers in that particular war and our role as chief labor in Mano de Obra Barata. Uh, you, you know, I'd also like to mention, uh, I'm not sure everyone's aware, but uh, Rosalio Munoz uh, was a student body president here at UCLA. And he was also at the forefront uh, at the Chicano Moratorium and uh, was targeted uh, during that period of time. Uh, I was actually present also uh, at the event, not too far away from where you were situated at that time, but uh, where we were attacked basically by both the uh, Alley County Sheriffs and the LAPD in a coordinated uh, violent attack against the community. And, um, and so to have such a, a, a presence uh, here, uh, who's basically a survivor from a major moment in the historical period, uh, and, but again, for Oscar to go out and to photograph and capture Rosalio in a moment prior to that, uh, it's, it's kind of one of these uh, moments, uh, very difficult, uh, you know, you can't really plan for that, but it's kind of, uh, you know, here you're reflecting on a little moment, but it's really within a context, a very important cultural moment, a historical moment that really, again, through the arts, had been basically uh, suppressed, and it wasn't until, really, it actually almost had to start off going to the Pompidou first, before they included the Chicano Moratorium into the timeline of the history of uh, Los Angeles, that then Los Angeles had to rediscover its own history, which is now then included as part of the uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, which again will then go out to a much further outreach and people will understand. I mean, even in this week's LA Weekly, it's included uh, you know, your, your uh, distinguished role in moving forth uh, uh, the, the, the Chicano movement and again, Oscar's role in documenting and, uh, and, and playing a big role in being able to provide the imagery by which the, the tale can be told fully. Well, well, to tell it a little more, it wasn't just LAPD and the sheriff. Well, of course, it was FBI. the FBI. And of, course, uh, and of course, you and I both wound up on the Coin and Tell Pro uh, uh, list. And of course, uh, you know, everything being falsified. And, and of course, this was all the Cold War. and. Um, you know, of course, everyone that was after us, they were all discredited themselves. They were much bigger criminals than we ever could have hoped to have been. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar, uh, going back to uh, Selman's uh, comment, did you personally care for your own safety while documenting your, your photograph? Well, um, who, who is that back? Oh, there's Art, Art Leon? Hi, Art. Hi, Art. Hi, Art. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, there was a time because, um, well, this particular image I took, it was probably one of the first uh, demonstrations that I went to, and uh, uh, a subsequent demonstration, perhaps the one after, uh, well, during the, the 29th, I mean, I was there um, when when the sheriffs were, were tear gassing the people at then a Salazar, or where's it? Um, Laguna, Park. Laguna, Park. Laguna Park and became Salazar Park. But I, you know, I, I didn't really feel a fear. I mean, I was there and I was like feet away from, from the sheriffs. And I, I think I, my, my previous experience, I mean, I, I didn't feel a, a fear. 
But at one point I did have to run uh, at another demonstration when after the, uh, the, the pictures came out in the LA Times the next day after the, uh, the t August 29th, there was a, a demonstration in, in uh, 16th of September which also ended in, in, a, in a confrontation and there was tear gas being lobbed back and forth, um, back uh, towards the, uh, the demonstrators. And so we had to, as a photographer, I mean, I was there to document the event. I was, I was there, I was actually behind sheriff lines until they found out I didn't have a press pass and they told me to get out, to get over uh, there. Yeah. And then right on the corner of Eastern and, no, actually, yeah, Eastern and, and, um, and Brooklyn, which is now Cesar Chavez, I was at the corner when, when, when uh, we were chased by, by a number of deputies, I think the deputies were out to get the photographers. And then on another occasion on Whittier Boulevard and, uh, and Atlantic, we had to, we had to run uh, quite fast, and uh, luckily I was a good runner. But <laughs> on the other hand, I mean, I, 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 not, to, not to sugarcoat it, but of course those were the 70s, and, and now as a photographer, I've continued to, to, to kind of, the flip side of it is that as a photographer for the city of Pico Rivera, I, I work hand in hand with the sheriff. So I go along, I've gotten to ride in helicopters with the sheriff. I go to barbecues with the sheriff. The other day I went on a, on a, on a um, the, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, the, people are people and institutions are institutions. So I try to be at, at ease or at peace with everybody. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, there were some bad things then. I think now what's interesting, you know, my own personal flip is that Sheriff Baca is a Hispanic, he's a Latino, and, and, and uh, there's a, you know, there's a uh, progress being made. But, but I did at one point, to answer your question, there was times that I feared for my life, but, I mean, not for my life, <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, you know, had to be careful. I didn't get beat up, but I've also felt that from the from the from the Hispanic community. I mean, right. I've been out where where in situations where, you know, I'm I'm um, there's elements in the community that I went into a community once where there's a lot of drugs going on, and for some reason they thought I was there to 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 deal drugs or sell drugs, and I was confronted by some by Chicano gang people to get out of the community because they didn't want me there. I, I was there to take pictures. I wasn't there to sell drugs. So, I mean, you, you, get, you get, you know, uh, kind of confronted by both sides. So, Richard. Yeah, yeah. did you do much of the developing of your the film that you, the pictures? You yeah, did? most of the film that I shot in the 70s, in black and white, I would develop it. I would develop it and print it myself if it was color, I didn't. I had to send it to a lab. And then now I shoot a lot of digital. So I, I have my own digital library and I, 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 print, my own, I print my own. And, um, but in those days I did develop my own film because I, as part of my uh, studies at, at, at Northridge, I studied in the art department. And that was one of the things you had to, you had to develop to develop my own film. Oscar, when you're shooting two and a quarter, Yes. Do you, you go out all day and shoot two and a quarter? Do you have to be more judicious with the frames that you expose? Yes. Well, this was a two and a quarter. Two and a quarter refers to the format of a camera, which is similar to some of you may know a Hasselblad or a. I, I'd never owned a Hasselblad, but I owned a Mamiya, <laughs> a Mamiya two and a quarter, and uh, and that only holds ten shots per roll. If you get a large roll, it's twenty shots, but but. Um, I was much more um, uh, frugal, or I didn't shoot as much. Obviously, you don't shoot as much because you don't want to be changing roles. You have to be more selective. Where now with digital, you just shoot, 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 shoot. You get, you know, I get a thousand images on a on a on a disc. But yes, you have to be, and uh, I was more selective in what I shot, and. Um, it's a little bit different than a 35 millimeter. A 35 millimeter would give you a little bit more freedom, whereas a two and a quarter, you're looking down and you're you're seeing a reverse image, and you have to adjust. Uh, I would like to hear a comment from you about all of these images that you've taken. Uh, that you have 
here, uh -huh. you know, just, you know, what, you know, something that, you know, just hits you that you want to say, a comment about. Okay. Uh, uh, pictures that you, took. you mean like flip through them and give you a yeah, comment on yeah. each one? Okay, we can do that. Let me take a couple more questions and then and then we can do that. Let's see. Uh, uh, Armando Duron. Yeah. Um, my favorite image is the Maravilla Project image. Uh huh. And maybe because I lived there. Uh, but do you have other images of before they were torn down? I believe I do, and I have some. Apple. Of course, those two walls. Uh, m maybe I can refer to it. Um, it's, the, it's the image of the two walls with the Virgen de Guadalupe that, that Armando's uh, referring to. And uh, I do have more images of it before. And, and those two walls were preserved, and they're now a, 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 a monument there or a, a, a tribute. Which, and I just recently photographed them, but I do have other images of that. Hmm? Can you hear me? Yep. David Botel. Oscar, with the, all your images that you have, have you come up with a system or a way of cataloging so that you can <laughs> go right to your spot? You well, um, my system is, it varies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Like when, uh, well, when Harry, you know, first uh, got me in contact with Chon, and Chon uh, sent out a, a librarian to to our house, and she and I sat down and we looked through a number of books, and she picked out, um, you know, the three thousand images, which is maybe about a tenth, or not even a tenth of the things that I have at home, or I just well, uh, I have them in negative books, which are negatives, and I have them somewhat categorized by, by decades or topics. And then in my computers, I, I have, it's a little bit easier to, to categorize, but I do have them either by years and by topics. And at work, where I work for the city of Pico Rivera, I do have an archive of, which I, I archive in terms of years, events, uh, topics. So I have, I have in, in high school, I, I actually worked in the library as, as punishment for, for ditching too many classes. <laughs> so I learned to, uh, to, to do some library science, so I, that helped me. But uh, I do have, like the streetscapers, I have a catalog on you guys. So. <laughs> and, uh, and I have, you know, I have the, the moratorium, I have, you know, I have family, I have trees, I have cats, you know, I do different things. <laughs> But, uh, okay. Uh. Yeah, I was wondering if either of you have uh, noticed uh, maybe a tension between the cultures, like from Mexico versus like the Chicanos over the last 20 years? I mean, do you, you get what I'm kind well, of saying? Uh, you know, I, I think at some point in the past, there might have been sort of this distinction. Um, I think maybe with the change in the uh, population, uh, you find that there's been sort of a more uh, uh, attention to incorporating both groups uh, and trying to understand each other. I think earlier this year, uh, well, you know, uh, I think Mexico made an exception and uh, showed some Chicanos at the Bayes Artes uh, that I was included in. And uh, right now there's a show uh, taking place at the Museum of Latin American Art, which is precisely that, bringing uh, Mexican and Chicano art together. And, um, and also in the schools, of course, uh, throughout all the young people are growing up, um, uh, you know, some people multi-generational uh, Chicano and at the same time many new immigrants. And um, I, f I find that maybe the, um, uh, what might have been at an earlier point a little bit more conflictive is now an understanding that, uh, you know, we all have something in common. Oh, uh um, did you want me to address that too? Could you sure. repeat the question? No, I was just wondering about if you've noticed any kind of tension between like the, the Mexican culture from Mexico versus our Chicano culture being born here right. in the, yeah. over the last 20 years. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Pico Rivera is a good place. Yeah, <laughs> it is a very, very good place. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think the, I think the tension um, that has perhaps has existed in the past is, is softening, and I think there's more of a collaboration between, as Harry said, cultural institutions. And I know that 
there's a lot of crossover. I, I see a lot of, in Pico Rivera, since you brought that up, I mean, uh, they have a lot of uh, 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 charro events. And, and, and that's usually people that are very entrenched in the Mexican culture. They have, you know, and they continue to, to promote uh, the charro, the art, art, the lifestyle of the charro. And, and the pride in that. And, uh, and the, the local community, you know, participates. And, uh, and I, um, like right now, there's also a, a, an exhibit in, in Mexico at the Museo de Arte Moderno, which I, some of my photographs, I was asked to participate and provide photographs of some of the, not necessarily my, my images, but images of murals. And they, they wanted to show the influence of the Chicano to the Mexican artist. And they were they chose a, an image by Judith Bach, uh, Judith, I'm sorry, Judith Hernandez, one by this, um, uh, I think it was Charlie Felix, possibly one by the streetscapers, I forget which. Uh, and the last few months have been very hectic, but uh, so some of the information gets a little blocked. But there is an effort to uh, to to you know, it reinforced the, uh, the the similarities in the cultures, and that particular exhibit is going to travel to the Latin American Museum in in Long Beach, and so it'll be in Long Beach soon. So, anyway, that's uh, in a nutshell. One more. Okay, one more question. Um, Jesse, in your forty some odd years of march to the follower, are there more? More venues where your work and your writing it can be accessed or available to the public and certainly to education to the schools where both of the much accounts are going. Are there more app, more venues where your stuff is um, not just accessible but asked for? Well, um, I. I think one of the things that's kind of happened really is sort of uh, through the work that's being uh, promoted at this particular moment in time with uh, the funding of the Getty to really sort of accelerate it and get it out there. Uh, what's happened is uh, many of the different um, art publications uh, have started to write about the work. And, uh, and of course, this is all read by the major institutions throughout the country and internationally. And of course, it's stirring things up. And so you start having other members of the, of the sort of very established art community starting to make reference to Chicano art and even their comments. I mean, yesterday was kind of a surprise, uh, but uh, uh, these kind of things where, um, uh, you know, you start getting sort of a more of an inclusion in the dialogue. Well, there's probably going to be more questions asked when Chicanos are not included in exhibitions or in publications. And uh, you know it's uh, it's 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 something that uh, we can only hope will continue, and but it's also something that's very difficult to erase once it starts being introduced. So um, in a, in a very big way, I feel that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I, I'll, I'll restate once again. I think that the term Chicano has been uh, re reasserted uh, into the dialogue in a very important fashion, as being recognized as an instrumental aspect of American culture. And that, I think, will not go away. And, um, and although many of us are, are getting older, and, uh, still, but we're all still working, there's a vast uh, number of younger people, uh, not only Chicanos, but uh, many other artists, that uh, will accept that kind of a, of a relationship and understand that there's many different types of people uh, providing information. Um, so it doesn't have to be confrontational. It's something that uh, you know, certain people produce, and maybe some aspects of it could be influential for others. And at the same time, Chicanos are always open to influence also. So it's, uh, it's, it's important to understand that uh, you know, we're, we're actually part of a, a bigger picture. Uh, and at the same time, we cannot be excluded from that bigger picture. What he said. <laughs> what he said. Not there. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> I wanted to comment on, on uh, number nine, the, uh, that there's uh, Father Juan Santian. And I think this documents oh, yes. that the, the beginning to have, and still not enough, 
Chicano priest. And he was one of the first Chicano priests that really went out and uh, the Catholic priest because of Father Luce and others were doing it <coughs> in other denomination. But you caught that in the, there in the early 70s, Chicanos having more of a Chicano wedding with a Chicano free priest that's not in the traditional gowns. And I, I think that's a very historical thing that we, we do. And then just one other thing is that number 26 of the guy uh, dressed up as an Aztec uh, warrior, right. but it's a, probably a Chicano. Uh, I really love that one. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think we're out of time for questions, and uh, I, I, I wish I could uh, um, honor your, your request, uh, Richard, to, uh, to go through and make comments, but perhaps Perhaps uh, we can arrange another event, or uh, we could go upstairs and, and do a, an in, informal walkthrough, although with so many people, I, I think it might be difficult. But, but I, I do appreciate everyone being here. And uh, um, Chon? Did yeah, I'll just take the kind of co-curator's uh, prerogative. And, and uh, first of all, I want to thank you both, but I want to make an observation that most people may not be aware of. Uh, the Getty Foundation and supporting uh, Pacific Standard Time Initiative is doing a global marketing campaign. And what became apparent this week is that there are two photographers that are representing, whose work is representing the initiative, Harry Gamboa Jr. and Oscar Castillo. Uh, yesterday, the San Francisco Chronicle and their front page coverage of Pacific Standard Time had Oscar's image. If you go to a Bank of America and you uh, try to make a transfer of funds over to my account, which is very easy to do, <laughs> after the transfer, if you stand there for five seconds, you'll see one of Harry's images uh, from Osco of Instant Mural. And it's really, I think, uh, been satisfying in terms of the years of effort to kind of uh, really to participate in this initiative fully, uh, to see that happening in addition to what one would expect is the, the fairly canonical work getting the attention that it deserves, uh, but the lesser known but no, no less iconographic work uh, done by artists like Harry uh, and Oscar, really standing in for the broader initiative, not just uh, for Chicano art. And it's part of um, really that fact why when we were first approached by the Getty to contribute a show, we said, no, we're going to do three shows. And it has now grown to five shows um, that we are doing on our own. And there's another three or four shows, uh, including the OSCO show at LACMA. So that uh, what you have is a very thorough integration, both in terms of uh, Chicano-specific shows, but also Chicano artists in other shows. What I'd like to do, in addition to thanking uh, Harry and, and Oscar, is to acknowledge the other artists that are in our shows that are here. Hopefully, if I, if I miss somebody, raise your hand. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, we've got uh, Johnny Gonzalez from here. <laughs> Johnny's one of the co-founders of Goaz Art Studios and, and uh, the East LA School of Mexican, <laughs> East LA School of Mexican American, American Fine Arts. Arts. I know the uh, acronym. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the mural that he uh, designed and, and uh, painted will be uh, the first thing you see walking into the gallery, uh, which is the first mural on the first Chicano art gallery. Uh, another artist in the show is Barbara Carrasco, walking down the <laughs> gallery. In addition to knowing how to make an entrance, uh, Barbara, <laughs> Barbara is also uh, one of the members of the Centro de Arte Público in Highland Park, and would later than be a, a artist for the United Farm Workers. And then we have uh, Los Dos, Arevo Poteo, and Wayne Keeley. And uh, what's great about them is that they made their first mural, what, about uh, 50 years ago? Uh, in grade school. <laughs> uh, Wayne was going to be part of Mexican Art Center. Uh, David, along with Johnny, and uh, Joe Gonzalez was part of Goaz Art Studios. And then in 1975, they teamed up. And at the time, it was all about numbers. You had Los Four and all this. So they became Los Dos, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, that grew to just be East Los Streetscapers with a, a larger number of artists after 19, uh, 1980. I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, two other people that are here that have helped 
make this happen, starting with Ricardo Munoz, who helped uh, in, uh, along with a, no a large number of individuals uh, support the conservation of Johnny's mural. <laughs> And then uh, Armando Duron, who also contributed to that effort, but as well uh, uh, curated a selection of works from his uh, family collection with uh, his wife here, uh, Mary. And uh, they, what was really interesting is we realized we'd had the four shows in place. They're in the catalog. And we just renovated our library, and Armando had been a, a kind of a key force behind that. Um, we. Uh, realized that we had set up the library so it could have an art gallery space, but outside are cabinets uh, for archival displays. And what's amazing about uh, the Duron family collection is it's a mixture of archival documents and the artwork. And so we asked him to do a selection. It was really fun seeing him in the last week coming in with uh, jeans and his baseball cap and running shoes. You know, you're, you're, uh, he's a lawyer, you know, so this is his unlawyerly uh, <laughs> guard. Brought his daughter in to help him uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the hangings, see him put on the white gloves. Um, and we're really excited about this because we feel that, that that show in our library where we have a fairly large number of students coming in will actually help bring attention to the shows down in the Fowler. In the same way we want to direct uh, people coming to the Fowler to come up and see the research side of this effort that we've been working on. Um, I'd also like to just point out uh, one of my co-curators, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, here. <laughs> Uh, she's kind of the Wayne Newton of Chicano art. She's the hardest working curator <laughs> in Los Angeles. She's working with us, uh, co-curating our number of shows. I feel like a, a sixth one will pop out any time. But uh, she's also uh, curating two shows for the Cultural Affairs Department uh, and is just quite active um, uh, as a curator of contemporary art. Uh, I, have I missed somebody that's in the show? I sure hope not. Uh, last. Uh, Person I'll point out is uh, somebody that started as a Getty multicultural intern working at the, uh, the center, but he's a photographer and he was getting his uh, 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 degree in photography and came in and began working with us on our digital collections. And it was great because we had a, a number of orphan collections where we don't know who did the photographs, but he could tell us the paper stock uh, within a few years when the photograph was made and begin zeroing in on that. And he was very helpful as we went through many times all of the imagery that we had of Oscars and began narrowing down uh, the selection. And that's Chris Anthony Velasco. Right there. I think that's it from the curatorial end, but uh, I just I want to say how uh, thrilled we are to have this show up, to have it really inaugurate uh, the series of shows that we'll be opening uh, over the next month. The opening for uh, the, the, the celebratory opening for um, Icons of the Invisible, but also for Mapping Another LA will be Saturday, October 15th uh, at 6.30 uh, here at the museum and encourage you all to RSVP, their invitations out in the hallway, and tell other people as well.